it's available on the phone because okay okay i've started recording so so, yeah we can share with the students who are here um so yes one of the things i wanted to talk about before he gets on the line is the importance of the opportunity that he's presenting to us you know sometimes when people present the opportunity they'll just present it they won't tell you that you know it's important you have to kind of see and decide that it's important um but i know that not all of us have been in the china africa space so maybe we may not get how important it is so i wanted to stress how important it is before he gets on the line um like i said you know if you're you're going to reach millions of people by writing on his on his website one two the type of people you're going to talk to via his website and he doesn't want people to just contribute once he wants you to contribute as as often as you would like so if people come to know you as a contributor on his platform the kind of you know people you're reaching we're talking about stakeholders in china and the chinese government that is huge like i don't i don't know if you guys really understand that but when we talk about you know geopolitics and where china is right now to have access to that to be able to influence and speak to people on that level is really impeccable but three on the other side i want you guys to think about the opportunities that will come from this you know and one of the sessions that i'll do when we get close to the end of the training before you start your campus chapter is i'll talk to you guys about how to leverage the things that you're doing who you are for even greater opportunity if you want to study outside let's say you want to go to the us or you want to go to china to study and you say that you are a contributor on you didn't just contribute once let's say you 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 really contributed several times you were sharing your thoughts opinion and he doesn't want it to be towards an agenda you don't have to have a specific Let's say you're in Lagos, so you know that there's a big, you know, manufacturing plant that Chinese own. What are you seeing? How do people feel about it? People want on the ground experience. So let's say, you no, know, whatever it is, you're sharing it, right? And you tell, you know, you say on your application that I was a contributor on a platform of this nature, and people already, you don't even, most of the time, you won't have to explain it to people who are in the China space or the China Africa space. Or even people anywhere, what the China Africa、uh, podcast or project or the business is. If you're able to put that on your application to a school in the U.S., in the U.K., in China, I guarantee you that it's going to open so many doors for you that you would not get with any other publication. I can say that for a fact. You know, so I just want to make sure that we know that. We know what we're about to get into. Like when he told me that he would like us to contribute, I can't tell you guys how honored, excited, proud. You know, I I really felt like this was. I wasn't expecting this to even us at this stage because we're we're such a young organization. We just started with you guys this year. Um. So for him to say that he wants us to be contributors and be official partners, you know, meaning wherever he goes, he's going to say. I'm working with Africans on China, the young people on Africans on China, and they are contributing on our platform, you know. And he's working with foundations such as the Gates Foundation, the richest man in the world. He's working with their foundation to do projects. I I cannot even imagine what that will do for our organization, what that can do for you guys,、um, in terms of the opportunities that will come here. For you to lead in this space, which is all we want, for you to have a platform to lead, to share whatever it is that you want to share about this relationship and its impact on the continent. Okay.、Um, so I've spoken at length,、uh, and again, like I said, at the end of the, you know, at the end of the program in December, I have a session that I lead myself on how to leverage.、Um, but even before we get there, I want you to know that. This is not. <laughs> this is a big deal,、um, and I don't know. Seth, do you want to add anything to what I've said so far? Because, you know, Seth has been an avid, like, reader and contributor in the China Africa space. Anyway, Seth, do you want to add anything? Well, 
my boy is not good at the moment, but yeah, I think uh, Brian has made uh, all the essential points that you need to know because I think this is actually a very big deal. Especially, uh, you realize we have this uh, the African Conference of that Agreement, right? And uh, and any connection with China and all that, like this, this is going to be a very new area going forward. So I think you have to have the other opportunities. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Seth. So I'm going to put him on the call in, let's say, five minutes. Um, do you guys have any questions before he gets on the call? Okay, so I have, um, before I start, I want to thank you for the information that you've given us. And I've, I've, I've really learned a lot. But I want I want to know if um, you know how he should be addressed. How he should be addressed? Yeah, I definitely that, oh. Okay, that's a good question. Um, I I call him Eric. <laughs> I think he wants to be called Eric, uh, but his last name is Olander. So, I mean, Olander. 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 Yeah, so what will happen is when he gets on the phone, I'll try for all of us to get on video so that he can at least, if, if you all can get on video briefly so that he can see what you look like. And then you can go on video. Or, um, I'm all right, Bridget. But then, yes. Hey, with respect to writing on his website, uh, do we yes. have to uh, indulge in any particular research or like it involves in our living standards? Are that asking? What we basically feel or what we what we basically think about the china african space yes that's a great question and i also think that's a question you should ask him um when he gets on the line but um I, wow. from my perspective he's probably he's going to say oh he wants it to be from your perspective you know whatever you're seeing on the ground but here's what i'll say yes you you, you don't you know, you don't want it to be a research paper, but at the same time, you want to understand who this can reach. Do you get what I'm saying? This this is going to be... Yes, this yes, is yes, one, I get you. Yeah, your digital identity, right? You're going to be, you know, people, when people search your name, your article on that platform will come up probably first because of just who he is and his platform. So you want to make sure that you're presenting your best foot forward. You should have your own opinion and your own perspective and how you share it. But I think it should be your best representation of that, you know? So well, okay. well, well written, or maybe if it's a video, you tried your best to make it, you know, viewable, etc. Presenting yourself like the person you want to be. Okay. okay. That's a good question. Divine, do you have a question? Hello. Yes, I, I think I, I, I have a everything so far and my only question would be for the student exchange do we have to ask him like he said we don't have to be restricted to any number of contributions that we can contribute as many times as we want and then the it's very the hard to hear you what did you say again i said for the student exchange programs Yes. Like, is it often, like, would there be a specific um, registration process we have to follow, or do we just have to ask him how it is done? Yes, that's a great question. So, we haven't spoken about logistics. Um, he didn't tell me how he takes the contributions. I believe, he told me that he edits it himself. So, and he's had to do minimal editing so far. So I, I, he, he really wants to preserve your voice when you send in whatever you send in. Um, so we'll, I think that's a great question. You can ask him, like, what would be the process for submitting your contribution? Do you do it through the website? Do you email him? Um, maybe you email it to me. You guys will find a schedule. or something like that. So we'll ask him what works best. But generally, he just wants it to be flowing. So as soon as you probably get something done, he wants you to turn it into him so that he can share it. You know, with, with 
digital platforms, it's what he has is technically a media agency or a media platform. So for those kinds of platforms, the more content you have, the better. So the more you guys can produce, he wants a short, 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 but he'll explain all of that. So the more you guys can produce, the better it'll be for him. Um, and the and the better will be for you guys as well. Okay. 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 All right. So I'm going to add okay. him on the line now. All right. Uh, I, have, I have one last question. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So I I wanted to ask. Uh, is the article going to be? Uh, are they going to be posted on the China Africa Project uh, website, or he has a different platform for the students? Uh, for the students perspective on, on on the China Africa space. Yeah. So that, here's the thing. I hope you guys had a had a chance to um, look at the website, but the China Africa website. Um, okay, hello. Hello. Yes, you, so hello. you hear the static though, or is that on my side? Hello. Outside. Okay. Divine, can you guys please have to think of yourself? Can you make sure you mute yourself, okay. Divine? Okay. Everyone, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Eric. Hello. Hi, Bridget. Hi, everybody. Here, I'll turn on my uh, my camera so everybody can see me just for a little yes, bit. Yes, that would be great. That would be great. That, be uh, so hey, everybody. Hi. Hi, Aaron. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you guys. <laughs> Good to see you too. <laughs> oh man, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. Hi, Aaron. Thank you so much. I'm I'm en route to Philadelphia, so I can't be on video, but I'm very happy to see this happen. Nice. So how many yes. people do we have for tonight or today? Yes. yes. So we have five students with us. Um, some of our, our students couldn't make it because of exams and trips. Um, but okay. we're recording this session for them to, to be able to follow suit. Cool. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so Eric, one of the first questions the students wanted me to ask you is, what do you want to be called or referred to as? What do I want to be referred to as? Well, they can refer. So I, I'm technically a journalist, and uh, you know, so the managing editor of the China Africa Project. Awesome, but I think it's it's more in relation to your name. Um, so do you oh, want Eric. To buy, Eric is fine. They thought just go by. Letter. Keep it simple. No, 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 no. We're gonna keep it <laughs> keep it formal. Eric. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you so Thank much, you. Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, Eric, let's jump right into it. Please okay. share with uh, Africans on China a little bit about who you are, what you do, yeah. what you do um, and yeah, your work on the China Africa Project. Cool. Sorry. Well, let's get into it. So you yeah. guys, everybody's in Kenya, right? Or are you guys all over? We are all over. I'm from Ghana in particular. Okay, we got someone from Ghana. We got we, anybody from Kenya? We have someone uh, from Nigeria. Nigeria. Okay, we got Ken. We got Ghana, Nigeria. How about uh, anywhere else? Yeah, so our Kenya, our Kenya guy could have made it today. Okay. He's on a trip. Yes. Well, so we good. Have a, so have we, a, we yes, got yes. Ghana and Nigeria. Those are two good countries because at the end of the day, you guys feel the Chinese presence almost more than anybody. And one of the most exciting things about the fact that the Chinese are there is that, well, it's still so new that a lot of people in Africa, they're trying to figure out who are these people. And a lot of Chinese are trying to figure out what are we doing in Africa? So we're going to talk today a little bit about just some of the introduction, kind of who it is. And then I want to leave a lot of time for questions to be able to get your opinion and your talk and what you think about the Chinese in Africa. So... Uh, so cool, let's do this. You guys can go mute. I'll talk for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll just have some questions after that. Does that sound good for you guys? 
Sounds perfect. Thanks so much. Okay. All right, let's go. Okay, so hit on mute. If you have a question while I'm talking, just come out and let's go for it. You know what I mean? Don't wait until 20 minutes. You can stop me at any point you want, and uh, and we'll 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 do it. So, uh, okay. Uh, my name is Eric. I I've been a journalist now for 30 years. So I am older than all of you. Before you were even born, I started going to China. My first time in China was 1989, and uh, so my whole life was focused on being a, a reporter and a journalist in China. I just started studying Chinese in high school because I grew up in California. There were a lot of Chinese people there. This was back in the 80s. China was nothing back then. China in 1985 was poorer than most African countries are today. This is something that is so important for you guys to understand, that in the space of my lifetime, China has gone to poverty levels worse than Africa today to the second largest economy in the world. And that's going to be a really powerful thing that we're going to talk about because we're going to talk a little bit about kind of how people think of China compared to how people think of the U.S. or Europe or some of the West. And the soft power that the Chinese have is not the movies or Beyonce or anything like that. The soft power that the Chinese have is the fact that they've been able to do what many of you want your countries to do. And they've shown that it's possible to go from being a poor country. And I remember when I was in China in the early 90s, I saw babies who had bloated bellies and bulging eyes because of hunger. This was in the early 90s. There was starvation in parts of China. So it's really remarkable the journey that they've gone on. So my life, I start doing China journalism. I was a reporter for CNN, for AP, for the BBC, all in China doing all this stuff. I never really focused on Africa. But then in 2005, my brother, he moved to Kinshasa and he started doing a, uh, a TV production uh, on HIV. And uh, so I went out to go see him. I go out to Kinshasa. There's no China. There's only one Chinese restaurant in all of Kinshasa. 11 million people, one Chinese restaurant. It proves that there's a Chinese restaurant in every city in the world. But I didn't really expect to see any Chinese who were there. I go back in 2006 to, to see my brother, and there were two Chinese restaurants that were there. I thought, okay, that's kind of cool. But by 2007, 8, and 9, something incredible had happened. The Chinese were everywhere. I mean, they were building the streets in Kinshasa. There were Chinese restaurants. There was Chinese supermarkets. There were Chinese groceries. There were Chinese people. It was just like, what happened? And I know that you have probably felt the same way. That in your communities, you know, 10 years ago, there was no Chinese person who was there. And now the Chinese are a presence in your lives. In Ghana, in the central business district now, the Chinese are really changing things up a lot. And we've done a lot of shows on this. And same in Nigeria, same in Kenya, same in South Africa. The fact is, is that China today in Africa is the most transformative country for all of Africa, for better and for worse. I want to be very, very clear here. Personally, I don't care either way. I don't take a side in this story. What I do is I tell the story of the Chinese in Africa because after when I was in Kinshasa and I saw all of this activity and this change, and I moved there in 2010, and, I, and I, so I asked my employees, I said, what do you guys think of the Chinese? And they gave me these really complicated answers. They said, well, I like this, but I don't like that. And that was so interesting to me compared to the U.S. and to Europe and the newspapers that I was reading from the Washington Post, the New York Times. China's colonizing Africa. China's taking over Africa. China's conquering Africa. China's the neo-colonial power. You hear that a lot, too. So in the West, and in Africa, it was, it's good, but it's also weird. So... That got me really interested. So I started saying, let me, I'm going to start, you know, writing a blog. Because in 2010, that's what you did. So I started going to talk to the Chinese because I speak Chinese in Kinshasa and some of the neighborhoods. And I started sharing this on a blog. And I didn't take a side. I didn't say China's good or China's bad. Because what I learned is that I can sit here with you today for the next hour and tell you that China is the worst thing that's ever happened to Africa even worse than European colonialism. 
and everything that I would say would be true. I could also sit here for the next hour and tell you that China is the best thing that's ever happened to Africa. And everything that I say would be 100% true. This is what makes the story about the Chinese in Africa so interesting, so complicated, fascinating. You can see this story from any way you want. And that's one of the things when you go online, you talk to your friends, you kind of read the news, you'll, you'll usually hear it one side or the other. China's terrible or China's great. You rarely hear the middle. So what I do is I spend my time in the middle. Some days I say it's good. Some days I say it's bad. Some days I say China is doing great things. Some days I say they're doing terrible things. You don't really know where I stand because I don't stand anywhere. So from the blog that I started in Kinshasa, then I went on to Twitter and to Facebook. And it was amazing because all these young people like you who had all these complex views on the Chinese – really started to come along and they thought it was really cool because I was trying to kind of be a bridge saying, listen, I've spent a long time in China. I, I speak French. I've spent some time in Africa. I'm interested in what the Chinese are doing around the world. And so then on Twitter, I went out and I got really busy in, when I was uh, later on. And so I looked for a co-host because I started this thing called a podcast back then. This was 2010 as well. And I found Kobus van Staden, a journalist in South Africa. He's now the China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs. And since 2010, he and I have been podcasting on China and Africa every single week for 10 years. <laughs> 10 years now, every week. And so we wow. have 430 episodes now on China-Africa. Go ahead, Bridget. Right, that's, right. that's incredible. I just wanted to interject and say that. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> so we didn't think, I mean, how many things can you talk about with the Chinese in Africa? Right. I mean, we thought we were going to run out of things to say after about, you know, six weeks, seven weeks, maybe a couple months. But it turns out that this story is so big, so complicated, so multifaceted. Africa, 55 countries, 54, 54, 55 countries, so many different cultures. And the Chinese are literally everywhere. From telecommunications to agriculture to military to investment to manufacturing. I mean, they're everywhere. But one of the things that I discovered when I was in Congo, and I've traveled now extensively throughout Africa, and I see the same thing. And it's exactly the same thing in China, where I, where I live for 15 years I've lived in China. In China, when you say the word foreigner, they say lao wai. Laowai is a derogatory word for a white person. Like when they mean foreigner, there's a very specific meaning about it. It means a white guy, either from the U.S. or from Europe. That's the only thing it means. It doesn't mean, you know, a guy from the Middle East or from Latin America or from Africa. When I say Laowai, it means a white man. And when I was in Kinshasa, they have a word called Mundele. And Mundele and Lingala means the same thing, foreigner. But what does a foreigner mean to a Congolese? Of course, same thing. It was a white guy. So one of the things back in 2010, 2011 that I, that I noticed is when the Chinese were coming, and I still notice it today, and I'd be interested to hear what you guys think about this because you're a new generation. When the Chinese came in, uh, in 2010, 2011, started to really ramp up, Africans had most part, when they dealt with foreigners, they dealt with Europeans or Americans, with white guys. The Chinese, they're not Europeans. They're not Americans. They see the world in a very, very different way. And Africans have really, really struggled to understand who are the Chinese? How are they different? How are they not just like every other foreigner that's come to Africa? And this has been a very difficult struggle for many African countries and many African people to understand the shift, the change that happens now. And so one of the things that we try and do is to bring that, is to explain that, the differences in terms of how Chinese are very, very different than Europeans. Number one, uh, they're not there to save anybody. They don't look at Africa as the same way that Europeans and Americans do. Most Europeans and most Americans, and you know this, they look at Africa as a place of, let me, let me give you a list right now, see if any of these are familiar. 
war, HIV, Ebola, dancing babies, happy dancing babies, uh, women who are smiling and happy. I mean, uh, oh, safaris, wildlife, right? Uh, you know, all child soldiers. I mean, we can go down the list of all the stereotypes of Africa that Westerners in movies, in their culture, in their mindset, you know, we are the world, you know, all those songs and all that stuff. That is deep in the Western consciousness about Africa. The Chinese come with none of that. The Chinese come to Africa as victims of European colonialism, the same colonial powers that conquered Africa. Very different mindset. In fact, today in Ghana, the ambassador, and this, uh, this is really interesting, and it shows you the difference in the approach. Shi Ting Wang, who is the ambassador from China in Accra, he's talking about the situation in Hong Kong. And remember, Ghana is a former British colony. Here he's talking about Hong Kong, which is a former British colony, and he's leveraging the power of that shared colonial struggle that they both had. China, in fact, supported a lot of the anti-imperial, anti-colonial struggles in the 50s and 60s. That's why guys like Robert Mugabe were very important to the Chinese right up until the end. So they come with a very different history than the European and the white guys. And it's taken a long time for Africans to really shift that mindset that when they're dealing with the Chinese side, they're not dealing with the guys from London, Paris, and Washington. And I would say to this day, people are really struggling. So one of the things I'm hoping that you will walk away from our discussion today is an interest in trying to learn more about the Chinese so that you don't make the mistakes that some of the older leaders have made and a lot of people have made in terms of thinking about the world in purely European and American terms because the Chinese are playing by a very different time. So time is a really interesting concept with the Chinese. They're not thinking about one year, two year, three year, five year, 10 years. What they're doing in Africa today and around the world this is a 100, 200-year plan that they've got. They think in time in a much different way. And understanding how they see time is so important because they're not worried about the little details of today and tomorrow and, you know, this happened. That's, that's a small little detail. And you have to remember that while China is very important to Nigeria and to Ghana, and to Kenya, and to South Africa. Now it's the largest trading partner of 44 African countries. It's one of the largest sources of investment. It's loaning huge amounts of money. So to Africa, China is super important. In fact, China is probably the most important country. No one is lining up to give Nigeria money to build railroads. No one. Only the Chinese are doing this at the level they're doing. $629 million last week was approved to build a port in Lagos. Uh, so that's from the Chinese. The Europeans aren't doing this. The Americans aren't doing that. So to Nigeria, for example, and the same for Ghana, and the same for all these countries, the Chinese are hugely important. But Africa is not important to China. Not at all. If you add up all of the trade from Africa, all of it, $200 billion every year, that comes out to 0.39% of China's global trade. Zero point, not even 1%, not even a half of a percent. In fact, Germany does more trade with China than all of Africa combined. So if Africa disappeared tomorrow, just dropped off the map for China's trade, nobody in China would actually notice it because it's less than 1% of China's total trade. And that goes to really understand the imbalance that happens in these relationships. And also it's very important that you often hear in Africa that China needs Africa. Well, it does and it doesn't. In the one hand, yes, it's great that, China, that Africa has a lot of raw materials, but there's a lot of places in the world that have raw materials. Mostly of what China imports from Africa is three things, oil, timber, and minerals. Those are the three things. That's about 70% of all imports and all trade that's done between China and Africa is oil, timber, and minerals. 
guess what? The Middle East sells a lot of oil. South America sells a lot of timber and minerals. Africa doesn't really have a monopoly on that. So economically speaking, Africa, not that important to China because they can get what Africa sells in a lot of different parts of the world, and they are now. In fact, we've seen trade with Africa kind of be flat or go down. 2015 was the peak at $225 billion, and it's been going down. Meanwhile, in South America, they do $300 billion of trade with, uh, with China. So it's going up with South America going down. But Africa is not important for uh, Africa's... Oh, someone can be put on mute, that would be great. Oh, okay. That, that's me. I just oh, okay. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. To this point. So part of, part of what I've been thinking when we have this conversation about, you know, whether Africa is important to China is, um, sure, in terms of trade, um, we don't have kind of the, the vested power to really leverage in that space, right? But I'm thinking of on the other side, on the business side, when you look at companies like Techno, or you look at, you know, you know, boom play, for example, right? So like on the opposite side, aside from the, the geopolitical space, when it comes to products, it seems like a lot of Chinese companies need the young African market to continue to grow, right? They do. In terms of penetration. They do. They do. So, and again, this is the difference between Chinese companies and European and American companies. So European and American companies will say the African consumer, well, it has a lot of potential. All of you guys, so much potential, but your ability to spend right now is not so much. So companies like Apple, even Facebook to the most, to a lot of extent, but a lot of American European companies say, you know what, we'll get to Africa later. But the Chinese, they're saying we got a different time horizon. So they're getting in early right now. And also the Chinese, because they come from a developing country, are also used to dealing in developing countries. So they're building new markets for their products. You're gonna start seeing a lot of Chinese cars. You're gonna see a lot of Chinese uh, appliances. You're seeing obviously technology right now. Many of you have Chinese phones like Techno, Inix, uh, 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 Huawei. So all of that is really important. But the last thing I wanna point out is while I was saying economically, Africa may not be that important, politically, Africa is hugely important to China. And this is where your power comes in, is that politically you're starting to see Africa more and more line up behind the Chinese against the United States on issues like human rights, issues like you know, at the United Nations, at the IMF. Over and over again, we see African countries lining up. Just today, in fact, I just posted a tweet right now, just before I got on this conversation, with you, that Ghana's ambassador, foreign minister just came out in support of China's position on Hong Kong, you know, where they're fighting. And this is after yeah, Ghana. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I have, I, have, I have one question on that. Yeah. Uh, given, given the fact that um, uh, none of, um, uh, no, no African country is on the UN uh, Security Council, Permanent Security Council, do you think the right. political uh, influence that Africa has is, is, is anything huge that, that China can do next? Yes. So individually, uh, there is no African country that has that much power, not even Nigeria. But as a block of 54 countries, you have a lot of power. Even a block of 20 countries, you have a lot of power. How does this, how do we see this power? So about two months ago, the, the, the job to become the head of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, came up. And the United States wanted to have their guy on top of this, of this group. You know, the FAO is not a very important UN group. But the Chinese wanted their group. Normally, to get the head, it takes two or three votes to get all the different countries to, to rally around one. China won in the first vote. Why? Because the entire African delegation, all 54 countries, voted with the Chinese. That is power. When it comes to Xinjiang, I agree with you. 
Yes, and, and what we need to do is educate Africans to understand that things like the African Union, like ECOWAS, like SADC, all of these groups have more power. But the big problem that Africa has, both with the Chinese and the outside world, you guys don't get along with each other very well. <laughs> Getting everybody to agree is really difficult because Nigeria, the big powerful country that Nigeria is, says, you know what, Togo, you're a tiny little country. I'm not going to slow down for you. Same thing with South Africa. They say, you know, Botswana, you're slow and you're small. I have my interests. I'm a big power. So getting African countries to be lined up is really one of the most important things. And if that happens, there's an enormous amount of power that can come out of that. Now, we're also seeing that Kenya is fighting with Djibouti right now to get a, a seat on the UN Security Council, and China is helping them to do that. So you're seeing this kind of working together, which is really, really important. So let's quickly talk. So go ahead. Okay, sure, Eric. Um, so before we move before on from move that, um, we I think we all been like really, really, you know, our mind has expanded in terms of thinking deeply about the economic power or kind of the economic importance of Africa to the econo the political power that Africa has that's important to China, right? Um, so as young people who want to be influential in this space, how do yeah. you think we can specifically influence political power vis-a-vis -vis China and Africa. Okay. Last, uh, th on, on African social media, about uh, two years ago in 2018, last year in 2018, there was a picture that went around all around African Facebook and Twitter. And it was at the Forum on China-Africa Co Cooperation Summit. This is the big summit where China gives a lot of money to Africa. And there was a negotiation. Maybe some of you even saw this picture. And on the one side, it was, I think it was the Nigerian delegation, but I'm not sure which country it was. But on the one side, there were the Nigerians, or the, and I think it was the Nigerians. And on the other side of the table was the Chinese. The Chinese side, the negotiators had their computers out. They had notebooks. They were li listening in, waiting to take notes and to really be engaged. And on the... African side of the table, not a single notepad was out. Not a single computer was out. And Af young Africans were like, oh, guys, come on. They were so angry over this because it really sent the message that Africans are not engaging. And it was just that visual. And all across African social media, people were so angry about this picture. And so one of the things that we need to see more of is more young people get engaged with China and what the issues are. China, let me tell you this right now. China will be with you for the rest of your lives. It is going to shape your countries for better or for worse. Many of you are going to have children who will grow up and paying off debt that your parents right now and their generation is taking on from China. That's how important this is. It will shape so much of what you do. You right now on this phone call, this Skype call that we're doing right now is only possible because of the Chinese. Think about that. The Chinese have put in 70% of the 4G network. Huawei has built most of the internet connections in Africa, mostly through loans that came from the Chinese government. Let's be honest here. Without the Chinese and their loans from their taxpayers, we would not be on this Skype call today. It is amazing to me that you can see me in video because only a year ago, this would have been very difficult to do in countries like Ghana and Nigeria. So I'm not saying that this is a good thing or a bad thing. I am saying that for your generation, it will always be. In places like Nigeria and some other places, is that the social media is a little bit like that the Western newspapers I was talking about. Are, they feel very passionate about China. It's either great, China's the best, China's giving us loans, China's building stuff, or they're the worst thing. They're the neo colonial, they're terrible, they're abusing uh, Africans, they're killing our markets, they're doing all the bad things. 
What I, I recommend for you who are just coming up in the system is to be in that middle space and to understand what's good and what's bad because they're both there together and both will be there for the rest of your lives. The Chinese are not going anywhere in Africa. Let me be very clear here. The Chinese are not there to conquer Africa. It is not their game. That's, they're not like the Europeans. They're not there to take land. They're not there to take ports. They're not there. They don't want that. It's too much of a headache. I met with a senior Chinese official in Beijing, and he, we, we, we were having tea together, and he was laughing because he said, you know, they accused us of wanting to take over Zambia National Broadcasting Corporation, that we took control of Zambia. And he laughed because he said, have you been to ZNBC? There's nothing there. It's a tiny little thing. We're so big, we wouldn't want this even if they gave it to us. That's the mindset of a lot of Chinese officials about what's in Africa. What they want from Africa is they want you to buy their stuff, just as Bridget said, to buy the phones, to buy Boomblade, to watch Star Times. They want you to watch their TV shows. They want you to do all of those things. They want you to help vote with them at the United Nations, but they're not playing the same game as what the Europeans are doing. And for you to be able to understand that, to remember at the beginning of my talk, they're not like the other foreigners. And for you to take the time to figure out how they are different, they're in your community. Go up and talk to them. Find out a little bit more. Get to know them as people. And you will start to see how they approach things very different. I can talk about this for the next five hours, okay? And really, I mean, I've done 430 podcasts, so trust me, I can talk for a long time. But I want to turn this over to you guys now to see if you have any questions or comments or how you feel about the Chinese. So we can use the next 20 minutes to, uh, to kind of talk about what you guys want to talk about. Thank you so much. Can you hear me, sir? I can't hear you too much. I can hear you a little bit. Okay, I, I must say it's exciting and Can you hear me now? I can't, yes. but there's a little bit of static on the line. Can you hear me now? That's a little bit. Oh, that's better. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. I said over the, um, the years, we have always thought that the, the Chinese um, benefit from Africa is more economical. Not until now, where you, you opened our eyes to so many things, considering the political factors that they yeah. stand to benefit from the African owing to the fact that we had a 50 country block, a 54 countries yeah. block in the UN and every other decision making body in the world. My question now is how can we, the younger generations now, come into play considering the fact that there are lots of um, uh, um, Chinese um, empowerment scheme and programs going on? How can we tap into this and become more useful? and see how the future will become better for Africans and for us yeah. to have a, a, a better relationship ends for other than just being political. Yeah. So, number one, so, every, so now more African students study in China than any other country in the world except France. And in France, it's only the French-speaking students that go. But students from across Africa now are going to, to China to study. So there are quite a few scholarships and the Chinese pay for everything. But if that's not an option for you, uh, in most cities now, most major cities, there are Chinese language institutes like Confucius Institutes where you can study Chinese and you can start learning about it. If that's not an option for you, uh, you know, to try to find ways in your own communities to start meeting and talking to people. Because one of the problems is that when we say the Chinese, that's as stupid, really, as saying Africans. There's no such thing as an African, right? Africa is 
thousands of cultures, thousands of languages, 55 countries. I mean, it is so diverse, a billion people. How do we take a billion people and put them under one word? Very different. Now, we do that because we have to, because they're shorthand. But China is just as complicated as Africa is. And so when we say China and Chinese, have the same respect that when we talk about Africans, that there's a lot of diversity. There's a lot of differences. You know, just so you know, most Chinese people, they don't like each other very much. <laughs> In fact, when Chinese immigrants come to Africa, one of the things that they will say is, where are the other Chinese? Because I don't want to be next to them. <laughs> and so you getting to know the Chinese side is also really important. And that's what I would say is the first most important step. So try to find Chinese community groups. Try to find, to either study online or to study at Confucius Institute. Find some way to make a connection with them. So they're not just this thing that you see online, the Chinese. Because that's kind of, again, as silly as saying Africans, because Africa is too big and too complicated and too diverse to be one word. And the Chinese are too. So that's, but the, the, so I go back to that picture. Don't be those guys in the picture who had no computers, had no notebooks, did not have questions, were not in curious and not engaged. You need to learn about the Chinese because they will be with you for the rest of your life. And they're going to shape your country's destinies in many ways. They're a big power. Now, that doesn't make you a subject of China or weaker than China. You have power in this relationship. You have a lot of power. And you have to make sure you exercise that power. So we're starting to see now people push back on the Chinese. So John Magafuli in Tanzania is starting to push back a little bit on the Chinese. That's a good thing. But you got to know who they are in order to know where and when and how to push back. That's the key thing. So the first step for you guys as young people and as students is start to study and understand Chinese culture, Chinese history, Chinese politics, the Chinese mindset, all of that. They're not white people. Now, us white people, we're not all the same either. But your experience with Europeans and Americans has been very, has been for the most part, not a good experience. And it has, it's really, it hasn't changed in a lot of years. Now you have something new that's right in your country, in your, in your neighborhood. You need to figure out what it is first. That's not easy to do though. Oh, well, Thanks um, for Eric, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you for this nice talk. I've actually learned a lot from uh, this presentation. But then I'm very sorry to ask. You stated initially that you don't want to state a stand on the China-African space. But then you also yeah. said that if you are given a chance to talk about uh, how the good things that China is doing in Africa, you can talk a whole lot about that. And if yeah. you take the negative side, we can talk a whole lot about that. But then right. I want us to hit the nail right on its head. So frankly yeah. speaking to them personally, do you think there is a... Oh, he just dropped out. Oh, no. He oh, he so just dropped out at the question. Yeah, I was. A, it was going to be a great question too. Right, right, right. Yeah, hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah Eric, okay. I'm back. I'm back. Again. I'm back, I'm back. Okay, you say, do you think? Yeah. And then it dropped out. So do. So ask me, do you think oh, again? Sorry, I said, do you, do, you, do you think there is an imbalance in this relation? Personally, looking at these two sides. Yeah. Yes. There's a huge imbalance. A giant. I mean, what country are you from? I'm from Ghana. There we go. Ghana is a great example, and I, I even use Ghana in my, uh, I have a presentation, which I'll share with you. Uh, I'll send you some of my presentations, and Ghana is the example. Okay. Ghana is a tiny, China now is loaning Ghana billions and billions and billions of dollars. What power does Ghana have to be able to push back on China? Let's say Ghana wants to support the protesters in Hong Kong. I don't know why, but let's say they do. Or they want to support the NBA. 
or they want to do something that China doesn't like. Ghana then would be in real trouble with the Chinese because when you borrow money from people, guess what? You got to play by their rules, right? Nothing's free in this world. Yeah, sure. Sure, sure, sure. sure. So there is a, there is a very big imbalance. And, and that is, and this is the thing when I talk to Chinese people. So I talk to Chinese students and they don't understand why Kenyans or Ghanaians are sometimes frustrated with China. They say, we're loaning Ghana all this money. Why are they so angry with us? And so with these Chinese students, and I just taught a class for 10 weeks to Chinese high school students. And this question came up and I'll, and I'll give you an example. So I said, okay, think about it this way. Japan to the Chinese is like the British to Africans because they colonized, but Japan was terrible in their colonization of China. And Japan still to this day has not apologized for it. So it's a really sensitive issue. Okay, British colonialism in Ghana is not really a big deal anymore. Most young people, they don't care about that. But in China, they still care a lot about Japan. So I said, imagine now that Japan wanted to build your subway. They give you a lot of money that for 50, 100 years, you're going to be paying back. Your children's children will be paying back. That's number one. Number two, they say, well, we'll come in, we'll build it, but we're not going to hire only, we're going to bring some of our own people in to build it. So the conductors, the engineers, those are all going to be Japanese. Oh, and by the way, we're going to make sure that for the next 20 years, it's going to be Japanese people that run it. They got so angry when I said that to them. And I said, you don't like it because you're losing control. And that sense of control is very important to you as a country. So all of a sudden, when China comes in to Kenya to build the standard gauge railway, same thing, Chinese conductors, Chinese managers, all of this stuff, people feel like they're losing control. And I remind these Chinese students, that your parents' generation on this call remember British colonialism. It was not that long ago when your countries did not have control because Europeans had taken that from, from you. So all of a sudden they start, oh, now I understand that this is more personal. And that was really interesting. The light bulb went off for them. So this sense that Africans are losing control of their destiny to another foreign power. When only 50 years ago, you just came out of this after hundreds of years of not having any control. Everything was stolen from you. Your language, your culture, your resources were stolen. And now there's concern, are we going back into that again? And the Chinese are not sensitive to that at all even though they like to talk about how we were the victims of colonialism, just like you, but yet they'll come in and they'll do things which are very insensitive. So this idea, how do you make sure you don't lose control of your culture? That's number one. Number two, Africans I find in general, and this is a big generalization, I just said it's hard to put one billion people under a, a word, but there is part of this as a collective culture. Oftentimes can be very quick to blame outsiders because it is much easier to blame an outsider than it is to blame your own culture. So one example of this we will hear in all across is that the Chinese facilitate corruption in Africa. And I was just on a call with Amnesty International and I was helping Amnesty come up with their one of their strategies for how to deal with Chinese companies who are building infrastructure, and they kept putting all the burden on, well, the Chinese are facilitating corruption in, in Africa. And I said, well, that's, that's interesting that you keep focusing on the Chinese side, but you don't focus on the African side. Because corruption takes two parties, one to give the money, one to take the money, right? So the other thing which we need to improve, and I said to them, I said, there is no problem with Chinese corruption in Singapore in Switzerland, in France, in Japan, it does not exist. Why? Because the governance is better in those countries. So what can you do with your own countries to improve the governance? So in Ghana, we have a big problem of Chinese gold miners 
right? Chinese gold miners keep coming yeah, in. Yeah, sure, sure. Why do we have that problem? Because of corruption in Ghana. Those are illegal immigrants. They are not there legally. They do not have work permits to be in Ghana. But yet they bribe their way through. So who is ultimately responsible for that? Is it the Chinese who are coming in? Or is it the Ghanaian government that is facilitating corruption? I don't know. It is the Ghanaian government. It's your country. Those are your laws. You should be enforcing them. If somebody is violating the law, whether they're Chinese or anybody else, well, then that's your responsibility. So, so again, we have to look at what can you do in your country to make your country stronger in governance, to reduce corruption, to improve the effectiveness of government. And a lot of African people, they feel as negative towards their own government as they do towards foreign governments. And this oftentimes gets mixed together with the Chinese. They say, well, I can't do anything about my government, so I'm going to be angry at the Chinese. I don't know if that's fair. Now, the Chinese deserve blame for doing bad things. But we also have to look at what different African governments are doing as well. And that's where you can contribute a lot. Well, um, right. you talked about uh, the issue of... You talked about the issue of Galamse in Ghana, but then I just wanted yeah. to remind you that the current administration in Ghana here is actually putting a fight against Chinese immigrants uh, doing this uh, illegal mining. Yeah. But then yeah. it's more of like China holds this kind of power on Ghana. So you can't say, hey, okay, now you can't come into my country to come and do these things. Because if you say something of that sort, maybe you need something from them for a particular project, and then that would be much of an hindrance to you. So actually, this is what maybe I'm sharing that. Be careful Some there African a little bit. The Galam yeah, I mean, the Galam say, for example, like the Chinese consulate, if you talk to the Chinese ambassador in, in Accra, Shi Wangting, and you ask him about the Galam say, he will tell you, these guys are the biggest headache for me. They cause me nothing but problems. I want them gone because they get in the way of all the things he wants to do on the official capacity. So again, we have to look at what are illegal immigrants and migrants who are doing things and what are people doing. So think of it this way. In Europe, we have a lot of illegal African immigration into Europe. The Ghanaian embassy in Paris has nothing to do with the illegal Ghana migrants in Paris, right? That's the same thing yeah, with the Chinese. Yeah, yeah. You cannot group them all together. The Chinese oftentimes find that their own people and their small, these small businesses that are not part of the state get in the way more than they help. And they're not, the Galamse are not being protected by the Chinese embassy. The Chinese embassy would like them gone. They would love them to be gone because they cause them headaches. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing that, Eric. So I know we only no, have, we have some of our students may still have questions. Have questions yeah. We only have 15 yeah. minutes more of your time. And I wanted you to touch a bit on um, just journalism and how you would like for them to contribute on the student yeah. exchange platform. Perfect. Okay. So um, I didn't talk a little bit about the China Africa project, and I'm going to send you my email. I'm going to give you all my links, and I want you to think of me as a resource for you. We can bounce around ideas, and you know, if you have questions, whatever you need. Uh, but I've built up the China Africa Project now. We've got 1.5 million followers all over the world. We have a podcast that we do every week. We have a website that we do, uh, you know, and we've got this thing called Student Exchange. And Student Exchange came about uh, when I was in Abidjan last year. And I went up to some young kids, they're about 16, 17 years old. We were in a cafe. And I said, what do you guys think of China? And they thought, well, it's a little bit strange that a white guy is asking me about China, but okay, I'll, I'll go for it. And one guy took out his phone and he said, La China is a woman. He was by the way, 17, 18 years old, a lot like you guys. And so I said, what, really? Interesting. He said, I love Huawei, Techno, Boomplay, Star Times. And they saw the world through technology. 
And I was like, wow, that is not an answer I would have ever gotten from somebody who was 30 or 40 or 50 years old. And so that got me to saying, thinking that your generation sees the world in a very, very different way than your parents and the old and 30 year olds old and up. So I said, I'm going to start this platform where high school and college kids and young people can write about China, Africa from their point of view. And so on my website, ChinaAfricaProject.com, go to the bottom and you'll see student exchange. Now I got mostly Chinese young kids writing there. I need to get more of the African side. So I would love for you guys. And then what I do is I share this to my 1.5 million followers on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter, in my newsletters. So you guys get to be seen by a really big audience to have your ideas shared. And we want to hear what you think. But I don't want you to try and be something you're not. I want you to write about what you feel about the Chinese in your community. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it you're not sure? Take some pictures. Tell us, express kind of what's in it. And it doesn't, don't worry about making it perfect. We just want to get your voice into the discussion. Because right now, the discussion about African diplomacy and African international relations and African... Africa's place in the world is all dominated by older people. And yet, Africa is a continent where the median age is 19 years old. How is that possible that old people are dominating the conversation when you're a continent of mostly young people? So we want to get the young voices into the discussion. That's what student exchange is all about. It can be anything you want it to be. Pictures, Take a video where you just do a vlog, take a phone, walk through saying, I've met some Chinese people. This is what I, your questions. It can be a little essay. It can be anything you want. Don't overthink it. And I'll share it with my community. Uh, that, so that's what we're doing on Student Exchange and would love, love, love to have you guys be a part of it. Oh, my gosh. That sounds so exciting, Eric. So, I mean, I'm so honored. We're so honored to have this opportunity. Um, I know I shared it with them a few minutes ahead of you getting on the call. And I think, Divine, you had a question about how to submit your contributions, if you want to ask yeah. that now. I think I was asking a question for the students. So for the student exchange program, yeah. so I was thinking, how do we get to, to get carried along? What do we have to do? How do we start? Is there a kind of education process? What do we have to do? You don't have to do much. You just have to email me. Your, you, know, you, know, you can do it a couple of different ways. We can talk about it beforehand. Let's say you have an idea, but you're not really sure. You, know, you and I can set up a time to talk. or We go back and forth on email to make sure the, we can bounce around some ideas. Or if you've got something you already want to do, you can just send it off to me and I'll publish it. Uh, you know, I might clean it up a little bit, put a little bit of editing in there uh, just to tighten it up. But uh, it's very simple. And Bridget has my email and we'll put it out there. And, it, and here's the interesting thing. For you guys, you'll then be able to put in your portfolio and on your resume that you were on the China Africa Project and it can help you as you try to build a professional uh, portfolio, and I'll give we I'll put it on social media on LinkedIn, for example, and then people will comment on it, and then you can cut and paste that and show people like, look, I'm I'm actually doing something serious. So I want to make sure you benefit as well. So because it has to be mutual in that way. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's yeah, that's perfect. So Eric, part of what we're doing is these are our students, leaders, ambassadors, and what they're doing is they're starting their campus chapters. Um, so actually they are the face for a much larger group of young people, as oh, you mentioned, of course, their university campuses. Yes. Yeah. Most of whom I think, um, Kofi is studying Chinese at the University of Ghana and they have a huge department. Yeah, um, that's so, cool. Go Kofi. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. So what we're, what I'm thinking. Thank you, Eric. Is, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm thinking now is, is it okay if, let's say, some of their, so the members of their chapters also want to contribute? Absolutely. And again, here's what I do. You see this room behind me? I just sit here all day making content for the China <laughs> Africa Project. Anytime, yes. Kofi, anytime, Divine, you want to schedule a call with me? I'm sitting here. I got my little dog that was with me all the day, too. 
So, you know, if you're going to get some students together and you want to do this together with your students, I love doing this. I love talking to you guys. And I want to, you know, if I, however I can help you to create a platform for you to talk about this. And here's the thing. Young people in Africa today are not talking about this. I'm telling you. I sit on African media all day long. Young people are not talking about this and you need to be talking about this because it's going to shape the rest of your lives mm. so let's start talking about it let's get a conversation across africa going and let's also engage chinese young people so that you guys young people to young people can start having a conversation together saying you guys are going to inherit this all of this mm -hmm. is going to come to you so climate change debt environmental impact trade all of this is coming to you so let's start that conversation now, and I'm here to do anything you guys need. Wow. Oh, thank you. Thank oh, you it's so my much. pleasure. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you so my, much. So, my pleasure. Oh, my gosh. We're so honored. I mean, we learned so much from your session, um, and I will definitely follow up on you know, what our next steps will be. Yeah, and share my yes. email with everybody and share the website with everybody. Yes, and, they have and it. You guys, yes. can, <laughs> you guys can, con you know, don't be shy, please. I really am telling you, don't be shy. You want to talk to me? Just send me an email saying, Eric, can we set up a time to do a Skype? Let's do it. Awesome, awesome. So, um, yes, and you mentioned that you would share with them some presentations that you have coming up. We would yeah. love that. I have some PowerPoints of, uh, of some of the talks that I give on China Africa, and, yes. and, and I'll share those with you, those, those, uh, a whole bunch of those presentations with you, and you can, uh, you know, that yeah, way, and I'll then questions, mm -hmm. yeah, so I'll, you know, we'll get that going, and I'll, I have a bunch of PDFs that I can share as well. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, so we've been following your website as a group, um, and we're so excited we finally got to put a face to the yeah. name, to the work. Um, so thank you so much for your time, Eric. We're going it's to stay on for pleasure. a few minutes to chat, cool. but I am so grateful. Well, thank you guys. And uh, I didn't get to meet everybody, but Kofi Devine, everybody else, you know, listen, have a great day. And I'm really excited to have the chance to get to know you all. And, you know, let's do something together. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank Bye, you. guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. 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 Hey guys. Hi, Hi Richard. How did it go? What do you think? It has been Hello. very empowering. Yes, yes. Someone, yes. Saying, yeah. Someone's mic is making a lot of noise. Hello? Yes, yeah, I can hear you. Go that's... ahead. One of yeah, you, so, go ahead. So, so, so. So basically, I think uh, Eric said a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff that I, I think I, I, I can associate myself with. It was great, like being a student at the University of Ghana around two thousand nine. These are the same yeah. issues that made me like. Uh, uh, <coughs> <coughs> gave me the interest in, in China because looking at a lot of these numbers and all a lot of these issues, I was like, wow, this is amazing. This is something that's going to change the world. And of course, since two thousand nine. To date, uh, for everyone has seen what what China's impact on the world has been, and the fact that he mentions a very a very important fact, like when I hear people say like whether China is good or bad, saying China is good or bad is, is too simplistic an argument to make. It doesn't make any sense. You, you have to actually dissect it to be much more further to actually reach conclusion based on a specific issue, because you can never say oh it's bad. So that's what he said. He mentions the fact that. Uh, Good things to say about China, find very bad things to say about China all the time. Yeah, so I find this is I'm, I'm, I'm a long time listener of uh, Eric's podcast. I think you guys should be listening to Eric's podcast every every week, the weekly podcast. Yeah. There was yeah. one particular one recently about uh, some Ch Ch Chinese trollers around the Cape Cape Coast Alumina area, and it was, yeah. it was quite an eye opener. I wanted to even talk to. The Ghanaian researcher who was working on the project. I think eventually I'll be talking to him because he, he mentions a lot, a lot of facts that I find really interesting. So I think I'm really fascinated by the, 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 the subject. So right. I hope you right. enjoyed it. Yeah.
Thank you Hello? so much, Chef. Yes, go ahead, Divine. Okay, I, I want to first commend the effort of the team to bring such a wonderful and resource person. Um, demands and contribution was massive you know, over the years. If you remember vividly, we were discussing about Ubon King last time, I think about a month ago or so, yes. when Ubon King was a lot of things about Africans and how China's and, and the Chinese have been able to and, and utilize a lot of African products and have benefited economically from the African space. So, albeit the um, Orlando got a different view and made us understand very mainly that it's not actually economical what they are benefiting from Africans. It is more of political benefit. And I think he, he, he's right. And we cannot as well do a lot of research there to also get to know more about the export and what it contributes to China space. That along with will help the boss and have a correlation to what he has said so far today. I'm just coming to for the very, very sound from the African China space. Awesome, awesome. I mean, here's what I'll say to your comment, right? Like, Eric, even though he, he says he's neutral, um, he might be having he might have his own personal biases. So yes, he can say that the relationship is, you know, at this point our biggest leverage is political, but I want to push you guys. You're going to in the process, we're going to be talking to a lot of different people with a lot of different perspectives. So I don't want this opinion to be the holy grail of what we now decide to go with. Um, I want you guys to make your own decisions, continue to talk to people. I would love for you, for example, for Divine to email him and further investigate. Like, okay, share with him the um, the video and say you would love his perspective on it. Like, how come, you know, you're saying that it's the, most of the, the leverages or most of our benefit for the Chinese is political, but... Others, other leaders in our space are arguing that it's economic. And perhaps maybe for the outsiders, what they see is little money to, you know, Africa. For a lot of Africans, that's big money. You know, they might say, oh, China's only getting one million from Ghana or one million from Nairobi, one million all from Kenya, or all of these different countries. And for the rest of the world, that seems like a very small percentage but when you think about the average African's income and you think about, you know, what our governments are actually have in their purse, you can kind of see that from a different perspective, you might think, OK, that's a lot of money or that's a lot of resources still coming out of the continent and going to China. So, I mean, I'm not taking a position. I'm just saying, like, there, there are a lot of different ways to look at this thing. So let's continue to put ourselves. I, I love Eric's work. Um, you know, ever since I met him in China, for someone of his stature, he's talking to you about consulting for Amnesty International, which is like the biggest, one of the biggest aid organizations or like, you know, um, the, the international organizations in the world. But still, he loves, he comes down to, quote unquote, our level, to the student level. He wants to engage with us, not on a, you know, on a surface platform, but on a really deep level to tell you what he really thinks, to share with you the opportunities that are in this space, to motivate you, to encourage you, um, but more importantly, to give you a platform for you to share your voice that you would not have otherwise, you know? So, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm so grateful for him. Like, when I, when I say it, I, I, it really means so much to me that he took his time um, to come and talk to us today at, at this length, to share his perspective. Um, so I'll follow up this week. What I'll do is I'll, I'll have all of you, um, those of those who aren't on the call, listen to the recording that we have. And then what I'll do is I'll have you guys write a quick reflection, maybe just a paragraph on what you learned from his conversation. This way everyone can hear it and everyone reflects. And then afterwards, I mean, like he said, he's ready. He's, him and I have already agreed on the partnership. Um, you know, with Seth and, and Sylvester, we've agreed on the partnership. So now it's up to you guys. So if you guys want to share ideas with us before you share with him, that's fine. But if you feel comfortable and you want to, you know, write your thing up and just send it to us and then we'll send it to him, that's fine. I think maybe for the first two months, I would, you know, I think Seth, Sylvester and I would love to see what you guys have. Not to change it, but just to see what you guys have before you send it to him. 
Um, so if you guys can share that with us first, just to make sure that, you know, we're presenting uh, our best. Um, maybe you might write something that you don't think about or a few minor mistakes that we can perhaps look over before you send it to such a huge audience, before he sees it, because you also want to leave a, he'll, he'll correct it for you, but you want to leave a good impression on him. Um, you know, you don't know how, how helpful he can be to your journey personally. Um, so we want to help you to continue to maintain a strong and positive and, you know, high level relationship with him um, from what he's already seen uh, and, and take it forward. And also, I, I, that's why I wanted um, all of you guys on the call, because what's his name? I think it's uh, Udemy. You, how do you say his name? Udemy? Does anyone know how to say his name? <laughs> It's Udeme. Udeme. Okay, Udeme. yes. So he's been writing to us a lot about what he's doing on his campus already, even before we start the official campus engagement. So I want to encourage you, based on what you've heard from Eric, if you want to share the recording with, you know, maybe some of the students in your in your class, if you're, you know, in your university who are interested in this issue, that's fine. If you want to share the opportunity for them to write to, that's fine. We don't want it to just be five of us. No, we don't have a voice if it's just five people. Imagine if we have, in our first month, 20 people contributing. I mean, imagine what a strong and positive voice is going to be, you know? That's what he was saying, like, like Seth the saying, you guys have had Chinese programs in your schools probably for decades, right? We're not the first ones to do this. But the way we want to be different is we want to bring everyone together to have a stronger voice. That's why we're not only doing Ghana, we're not doing Nigeria. We want to get people from diverse places, Kenya, South Africa. Imagine how much stronger our voices would be as Africans if we came together as a collective, you know? So try to push yourselves to get Find people who are, who, want to, who are interested in the issue or who want to learn more um, and also present to them the opportunities that we have. This is the first, but like I said, we have the Jack Ma thing. We have so many opportunities that will come up um, that we hope we can continue to share with you guys. Okay? Uh, so are there any questions before I have to run? No question for now. Okay. And, and then also, please, please email at the so his social media handles and share it on the page so we can all follow him and get to them more about him. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so I'll share Eric's information. I'm heading to, like I said, I'm heading to the University of Pennsylvania to talk about what we're doing. So I'll be available for the day, but uh, hopefully by Monday, when I get back to New York, I'll, I'll email you guys this information. Okay, all right. All righty. Well, thank you yeah. guys so much. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Okay, have a great day, guys. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a great day. Yeah. All right, bye.